Welcome. Rod Martin has done yet another video in his series exposing so-called global warming lies. The lie that he is exposing this time is our current carbon dioxide level is unusually high. Now I don't think that's a lie at all. It's actually an opinion. So this is my response to his video. Can you identify the missing link here? Martin starts off his video by saying the warmest claim that our current level of CO2 is too high and that CO2 is a toxic gas that will destroy all life. Now he doesn't give a link to who said this, when they said it, or where they said it, so one could check actually in what context they were supposed to have said these things, if they indeed said them at all. This is what's commonly known as a straw man argument. It's where you attribute something to somebody and then argue against it, even though they didn't actually say that. What the global warming specialists are saying is that we've increased greenhouse gases in our atmosphere by 50% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That's a large margin. There may be a few beneficial side effects, but most of the effects, as we've seen in previous videos, are very harmful. The argument is not to get rid of carbon dioxide, but to at least stop putting more of it into our atmosphere. You can have too much of a good thing. We all know that water is essential for life. Yet too much of it and you can drown. Oxygen is essential for life too, yet if you have too much of it in the atmosphere it becomes toxic. Also it causes fires. We can just see for example what happened to the Apollo 1 astronauts when they had a pure oxygen atmosphere and a spark occurred. CO2 is essential for life, nobody's denying that and nobody's arguing to get rid of all the carbon dioxide. But we already know that too much of it is harmful. With the more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we've had more intense heat waves, droughts, cyclones, storms, torrential rains and floods. Martin argues that there's no toxic effects from carbon dioxide, yet the American Medical Association would disagree with him. At the levels that he was talking about, you can get drowsiness, mild narcosis, reduced hearing, increased heart rate and blood pressure. None of those so is particularly good to me. And at slightly higher levels, you get dizziness, confusion and headache. Now, those effects have actually been observed on the International Space Station, and they're trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a result. Martin next puts up a plot of the recent geological periods over the last 550 million years. He then superimposes upon that the distribution of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over that time frame. And as you can see from the scale on the right, there have been periods in the past when carbon dioxide levels were much higher than they are today. But one thing that Martin glosses over and he shouldn't have done is the uncertainty on these measurements. So let me put in on with a dashed curve the upper and lower bounds of the uncertainties on these measurements. And here they are. And you can see those uncertainties are huge. What this means in scientific terms is that any point that falls between those two dashed curves is consistent with the original data. So let's put on our 400 parts per million line that's there in red. And you can see for most of the last 325 million years, our current level of carbon dioxide is consistent with the measurements. Now I'm sure that's not the case and carbon dioxide was much higher 150 million and 200 million years ago. However, it shows the danger of drawing hard and fast conclusions like Martin is making from data that is so uncertain. And we know from a previous video that I made that most of this plot is irrelevant anyway because the earth was not like it is now and really only about the last 40 million years uh, has an earth that's sufficiently similar to, the, to it is now for us to be able to use it for a useful climate comparison so let's take a more detailed look at that now this is a plot basically the same plot as before but they've uh, compressed some of the time scales we can ignore the, the plot on the right because that's forward projections. We can ignore the panel on the left because that's older data and we already know that that's not relevant. So here is the last 50 million years worth of data. Now the first panel is in millions of years, the second panel is in thousands of years, and the third panel is in years AD. So it's a little bit confusing but we can work our way through it. So on this plot, this is the carbon dioxide levels, uh, let's put the 400 parts per million again. Here's our red curve. As you can see, for most of the last 25 million years, the natural levels of carbon dioxide have not exceeded current levels. Equally, current levels are continuing to go up. So every year that goes past, we go further and further up this curve. Martin goes on a lot in his videos about the carbon dioxide extinction level. 
by which he means the level below which lots of plants and most animals will die off. Now I did a search through the literature to try to find a number for this and couldn't. However, I did find it on a blog, which is where I assume he gets his information. Now this blog is called Global Freezing Your Ass Off. So this says something about where Martin gets his data from. However, in doing a literature search, I did find a relationship between extinctions and carbon dioxide done by a fairly prominent oceanographer. And he claims that it is rising carbon dioxide or peaks of carbon dioxide that led to most of the major mass extinctions throughout history. So we should be worrying about increasing levels of carbon dioxide, not decreasing levels of carbon dioxide. Martin also goes on a lot about the difference between C3 and C4 plants. He claims that C3 plants will die off below 200 parts per million and therefore most animals will die off along with them. Well that just plain isn't true. Here's a series of rice plants grown at different levels of carbon dioxide. And you can see you can get reasonable plants down to about 60 parts per million. Yes, they're smaller, but that doesn't mean uh, that they will die off. That's a third of the level that he was talking about. C4 plants, on the other hand, are good to below 30 parts per, per million. Now, what's examples of uh, C3 and C4? Well, C3 includes rice, wheat, barley, soybeans, sunflower, oats, and alfalfa, all very important grain crops. But C4 plants are equally important. They include pineapples, corn, sugarcane, millet, sorghum, and cacti. Fruits and vegetables. Martin then goes on to talk about nutrition in these new larger fruits and vegetables. He implies that they are at least as nutritious, if not more nutritious, than the existing vegetables. But that doesn't make any scientific sense. I found a study where they'd grown a sort of variety of staple crops at 600 parts per million and measured the nutritional value in each one of them under normal field conditions. And here are the results. For C3 grasses, most nutrition levels were down. Similarly for C3 legumes but not possibly quite as much. C4 grasses were uh, lower, but the uncertainty on them is large enough that we can't really say one way or the other whether this is an improvement or a, a problem. I found a separate study on potatoes. Indeed, the plants were larger and the tubers were larger, but they were less nutritious. The only way you can get larger plants, larger fruit, larger vegetables that are as nutritious is first of all to add a lot more water. Most plants are 85 to 95 percent water. So if you want a plant that's twice as large, you have to give it twice as much water. And water is one of the things that we're having problems with. And secondly, to get the nutrition in there, to get the minerals into those uh, fruits and vegetables, you need to add chemicals to the soil. And so we're going to be throwing around far more chemicals on the soil. And we all know there's already problems with agricultural runoff into our lakes and rivers and oceans causing algae blooms, which rob the water of its oxygen levels and cause huge dead areas in the oceans just offshore. So what's the summary of plants and carbon dioxide? Yes, more carbon dioxide is beneficial to some plants, not necessarily all plants. But the studies that have established this have been single generation studies under ideal conditions, i.e. with as much water and nutrients as they need, not in real life field conditions. And it's also found that over many generations, the plants actually adapt to these new conditions and go back to the way they were before. So this is an initial benefit that you see, which eventually goes away. We hear a lot in Martin's video about how starved our current plants are of carbon dioxide. This is an old thing that the denialist community have used for years and it's absolute nonsense. This is a plot of carbon dioxide over the last 40 million years. Humans appeared about 200,000 years ago. Let's see where most of these staple crops evolved. Grasses started to evolve about 40, 60 million years ago. But those aren't the grasses we're used of today and not certainly the grain crops that we use today. Wheat developed about a million years ago. Rice about two million years ago. Sorghum about 11 million years ago. Millet about seven million years ago. Corn about 12 million years ago. And sugarcane about nine million years ago. Now you'll note that all of these developed at times of low carbon dioxide, 280 parts per million or less. So these plants aren't starved of carbon dioxide, they evolved in conditions of lower carbon dioxide, so that's what they're used to. 
He does say some pretty laughable things in this video. For example, beneficial global warming. No! <laughs> Nature has been slowly killing itself for millions of years. <laughs> CO2 could fall below 150 parts per million, resulting in the extinction of many C3 plants. <laughs> Humans have saved all life on Earth by restoring carbon dioxide. <laughs> and last but not least, increasing carbon dioxide in an era of carbon dioxide starvation is a good thing. <laughs> This guy is just a laugh a minute. Until next time, goodbye.